Are traditional expert calls in the investment world becoming obsolete? According to Stream, they are. And you can access primary research easily and efficiently through their platform. With Stream, you'll have the right insights at your fingertips to make the best investment decisions. They offer a vast library of over 26,000 expert transcripts powered by AI search technology. Plus, they provide competitive rates on expert call services, and you can even have an experienced buy-side analyst conduct the calls for you. But that's not all. Stream also provides the ability to engage with experts one-on-one -on -one and get your calls transcribed free of charge, all for 40% less than you would pay for 20 calls in a traditional expert network model. So if you're looking to optimize your research process and increase ROI on investment research spend, Stream has the solution for you. Head over to their website at streamrg.com to learn more. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. All right. Hello, and welcome to yet another Value Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker. If you like this podcast, it would mean a lot if you could rate, subscribe, review, wherever you're watching or listening to it. With me today, I'm happy to have Dan Day. Dan is an analyst at B. Riley. Dan, how's it going? Good, Andrew. How are you? Thanks for having me. So, hey, here. really excited to have you on. Uh, before I start this pod, before we get started, let me just remind everyone: nothing on this podcast is investing advice. Always true, maybe particularly true today. Dan covers a a wide swath of sock of sectors. Actually, we're we initially connected because you cover some of the really small, quirky cable companies. We're going to spend most of the time today talking about the SSPs, but you know, just a reminder: we'll talk about a lot of things. Everybody should remember not investing advice. So that out the way, Dan, th the company. We talked about a lot of stuff, but the companies I really want to talk about were particularly the ad tech companies and particularly the SSPs. Uh, the, the one that I'm probably most interested in is Magnite. The ticker there is MGNI, but mm -hmm. they have a publicly traded competitor that you probably need to talk about uh, when we when you mention them, Podmatic. The picker, ticker there is PUBM. You cover both of them. So I'll pause there. I guess one more thing before I... I have a lot of friends who are along this. I've looked at Magnite and they used to be Rubicon multiple times over the year. Every time I look at them, like my eyes start to bleed a little and I'm like, there's a lot of acronyms. I know like the very basics of what they do, but how they do it, the, the business, everything kind of still remains a mystery to me. So I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. What is Magnite? What are the SSPs and why are they so interesting? Yeah. So first of all, it's funny you say that because um, one, of the, one of the rationales for sort of pushing my coverage into the ad tech space is that I feel like the buy side needs a lot of help understanding an area where there was a bunch of IPOs and SPACs in 2021. A bunch of them are 70, 80, 90% off where they went public at. And yeah. a lot of people are trying to kind of pick over it and, and see what deserves to be trading, you know, where, where it's trading at and, and what's interesting. Um, so you're right. Tons of acronyms. You know, I, I um, started ramping on this space two, three years ago. It, it takes a lot to get going, but um, some, some really interesting names. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about the, the Google trial that's uh, likely next year that's very relevant for the sector. So um, but, but we'll start with um, you mentioned the, the SSP. So SSP is a supply side platform. Right. And in, in simple terms, Let's say uh, I'm browsing ESPN.com and you see a, a banner ad, right? Yep. That banner ad gets typically sold programmatically, which is really just real-time auction. So what happens is there's a demand side platform that represents the advertiser and there's a supply side platform or SSP that represents the publisher. This is, this is all sort of uh, dumbed down. It's a little more complicated than this, but um, this is enough for now. So on the DSP side, demand side platform, the number one you think of is the trade desk. Uh, the ticker on that is TTD. They are far and away the largest player in ad tech. Um, so, so if you're thinking DSPs, think the trade desk. The other big one is Google has one called uh, DV360. Um, so, you know, you're, you're an agency, you know, you're representing Ford. They want to blast out a bunch of banner ads. Um, you know, someone at your agency logs into the trade desk. They click, you know, they set a bunch of parameters for the campaign and they just get blasted out to a bunch of websites. Um, so in real time, the SSP is representing the publisher. So, right, the DSP wants to get the best price for their advertiser. The SSP wants to get the best price for the publisher. Uh, they meet in the middle, they come at a price and, you know, typically there are multiple SSPs involved in every auction. So the SSP that gets you the best price is going to win the auction and everybody has their own take rate. So you start at a dollar, right? Uh, let's say the DSP gets a 20% take rate. You know, the trade desk is about 20%. Um, and then the SSP side typically is a little bit lower than that. Uh, in, in an open auction programmatic, it would call it 10 to 15%. So 
off the top, that's you know 30, 35 percent uh, of the dollars um, going to the programmatic intermediaries from one dollar spent by an advertiser to a dollar received by a publisher. Um, so yeah, that that sort of just sets it up and, and what it does. And, and again, we're we're um, still talking about the open internet here. Uh, CTV is a is a whole another interesting game that's very different in the open internet, and it's very important for Magnite. So. Um, let's just stay on the open internet for a bit because because Magnite has two distinct segments, right? There's yep. their DV plus segment, which is display video and other. So, you know, think of like what I said, mostly banner ads and obviously also video ads. You know, if I'm on ESPN, again, I, I click on a video and there's probably a pre-roll ad that it comes up, you know, th those get sold programmatically. It, it's inescapable. I want to watch a seven second clip of a sports highlight from yeah. last night. ESPN insists, hey, you've got to watch this one minute long advertisement before the video, the clip will show. It's I, absolutely I watched it yesterday. It's like a, a 20 second clip I want to watch and you got to get through a, a 45 second ad first. Yeah. It's um, absolutely insane. So the, the only uh, uh, wrinkle here is uh, I keep saying the open internet. Um, so just for somebody who's totally new to this, the open internet is sort of the contrast to what you usually call the walled gardens, right? Uh, and there's three big ones. There's Google, there's Meta and there's Amazon and there's a couple of, what you call challenger gardens, you could throw snap and, you know, Pinterest and, and those kind of names in there. But um, when I say walled garden, basically those guys want nothing to do with DSPs and SSPs. Uh, everything they do is through themselves. You know, if you want to get by Google search, you're going to Google DV360. You're, you're going, you know, if you want to buy YouTube, you're going through Google DV360 and they're not using Magnite and Pubmatic to sell it. Everything is them. They put these walls up. And um, we don't play nice with ad tech intermediaries because we have the scale to say it's all us. Um, so those are the, the two. Like, so obviously YouTube, right, is the, the juggernaut in online video. You know, I think 40 billion plus in, in ad revenue in the turn on 12 months. Um, so, so just to be clear on that, um, there is no exposure to like YouTube for, for, for Magnite and Pubmatic. It's all, it's all um, you know, effectively everyone else who says, I don't have the scale and heft to put these draconian rules up and say, you know, even like ESPN isn't, you know, their, their, their competitive advantage isn't selling banner ads on the internet, right? They're willing to play with the programmatic intermediaries. Pretty much everybody is, you know, um, outside of really those three to, I don't know, there's a couple, to call it three to 10 smaller ones. So, and, and those three to 10 control 70% of, ad spend so i don't mean to minimize it but um so, the rest of the open internet is, is what we're talking about with with magnite and, so, and now a quick word from our sponsor are traditional expert calls in the investment world becoming obsolete according to stream they are and you can access primary research easily and efficiently through their platform with Stream, you'll have the right insights at your fingertips to make the best investment decisions. They offer a vast library of over 26,000 expert transcripts powered by AI search technology. Plus, they provide competitive rates on expert call services, and you can even have an experienced buy-side analyst conduct the calls for you. But that's not all. Stream also provides the ability to engage with experts one-on-one -on -one and get your calls transcribed free of charge, all for 40% less than you would pay for 20 calls in a traditional expert network model. So if you're looking to optimize your research process and increase ROI on investment research spend, Stream has the solution for you. Head over to their website at streamrg.com to learn more. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Let me just um, lob in a few questions. So I think a lot of people, when they look at this, they start thinking about the the video segment. That's the sexy segment. But as you said, a lot of it is still coming from, I think, more than 50% of the revenue is still coming from the, the kind of older banner ad questions. Let me just say the first question, the SSP, like if I'm ESPN, I work with multiple SSPs, right? I, I'm going to work with Dan's SSP. I'm going to work with Andrew's SSP and it's all happening in real time. But basically it says, Hey, you know, Andrew's visiting the website. Whoever's giving me the highest value ad, the, the ad I'm getting the most for is, is the thing that's going to go on the website. So I guess the question there is why is that? Why is the take rate for SSPs not a complete race to the bottom, right? Because the serving the marginal ad there is pretty costless and you know if you have an ad at a dollar if uh, if we're both got a bid at a dollar and you just said oh i'll drop my take rate to, from 10 to 8 percent then espn would go to you and then i'm incentivized to say oh well i'll go from eight to seven because there's no marginal cost so why don't I, I know the take rates are lower than the than the uh demand side here but why haven't they just kind of raced all the way to zero 
So, um, yeah, it's a fair question. This is effectively the, the, the bear case on SSPs is that they're just a commodity. Um, and so, like, you, you contrast the SSP side from the DSP side. Like, the DSP side has fragmented down to three that matter and then sort of a longer tail. The three that matter are the Trade Desk, Google DV360, and Amazon has a, has a large DSP. Um, and then there's like, I don't know, five or six others. Yahoo. Is there. Amazon's DSP, does that, is that only on their website and sites that are kind of taking Amazon or is that, is that all across? Like, are they ac actively bidding? Could, so, if I turned on, you know, advertisements on what, my website, could I start getting yeah. Amazon in certain DSP ads? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, and they all have their own sort of quirks, right? You, you know, you have to use Google DV360 to buy YouTube. Yep. You have to use Amazon to buy Amazon. So they, they almost have this lock -in. really the only like, independent one is the trade desk yep okay cool so so you know on the dsp side you've got these three and this is why the trade desk in my opinion gets a massive valuation premium to the ssps because this side has fragmented down to call it an oligopoly the ssp side right and again this this we'll get into this with google google still has 40 to 50 percent of the ssp side on market share so they actually have more market share on the SSP side than they do on the DSP side. So outside of Google as an SSP, um, everybody else is just so fragmented. Right? Magnite's probably the largest at less than 10%. Mm -hmm. Automatic is the second largest publicly traded with under 5% market share. And, and market shares for SSPs are, are pretty tough to back into. So, so, so take these with a grain of salt, but they're fairly rough numbers, but they're, they're directionally accurate. Um, and there's a handful of others. Critio has an SSP with mid single digits. And then there's like a million SSPs that are like, I'm good at monetizing mobile inventory in Germany and, you know, just things like that. So it, it just totally fragmented. And there's no reason that a publisher wouldn't just add one more SSP. Yep. That's been the, the case to date. So really this programmatic header bidding uh, uh, auction started to gain traction around 2016. And, you know, initially it wasn't too bad for the SSPs because there was only a handful of them and then more and more and more. And every publisher said, yeah, sure. We'll add one more SSP. Yeah, sure. We'll add one more SSP. What's, what's the, you know, if you throw, if you, if you win some auctions and give us a higher bid, what's the, what's the problem? Um, so you've got publishers probably on average using five to 10 different SSPs plus other things like Taboola and Outbrain and you know some, some other ways that they monetize, but it's probably too many. Um, and this has been an issue for them and it's why the take rates have have been depressed. There's, there's other reasons. The, the DSPs get a bigger take rate because they're also selling data. Um, like typically the data is bought on the DSP side. So, so Trade Desk's actual take rate was 12%. They're brokering data for another 8%, right? So, the, the take rate's actually kind of the same in, in an open programmatic. It's just the data tends to get transacted on the DSP side. Um, so, but SSPs used to be like 20% plus take rates 10 years ago, five years, not five years ago, but 2016 call it. And, and that's sort of gone down to more like 10, 10, 15% at most. Um, part of my thesis on why Magnite and, and Pubmatic are interesting for, for open. That, that was actually going to be my next question. And yeah. just before you hop in there, there is a big Google antitrust case breakup, huge YOLO upside there. Let's set that case to the side because it is there. It is interesting. But, you, you know, I think there's a debate on the probability and everything. And if that was your only thesis, I think you're you're in YOLO mode. I'm yeah. not saying it can't be a good part of the thesis, but you're in YOLO mode if that's the only thesis. So let's just put that to the side and say, why are the SSPs interesting, excluding that huge bull case? Because that long tail should die of SSPs. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one, they all sort of, so, so the, the very simple, nice way I put of it is an advertiser goes DSP to SSP to publisher is actually not, it's actually like way more complicated than that. Um, and for no other reason than a bunch of companies like figured out how to sort of wedge their way in the middle and take like a tiny fraction. Usually it goes DSP to an SSP who sells to another SSP who might sell to another SSP who might sell to a publisher. And so I'll go back to 2021 when it was just a crazy year for digital advertising. Everything was bonkers. Everybody was growing 20, 30, 40, 50%. Look at the stock prices for any of these guys. You know, I'll use Mag I, Magnite was 40 to 60 at the start of 2021. They could do no wrong. They were buying SSPs. And 
you know, as you and I were talking, Magnet is in the seven to eight range. So not that stock price is the indication of business value, but it, this was like ground zero for, oh my God, things were so good early 2021. Everyone spent all their time online. Things were going great. And yeah. now, you know, there's a lot of other things, but partly COVID hangover, things have gotten worse. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you were in the digital advertising business and you, you didn't have a banner year in 2021, you need to do something else because it was, it was pretty hard to, it's pretty hard to not. Um, so the, the point being is that like this got like way too complicated. And now you're talking that 35% of every dollar going into ad tech intermediaries, it's suddenly like 50, 60%. And in 2021, there was this, uh, you know, the ad tech people called it the FIFO, the fear of finding out. They kind of knew this was happening, but they were like, oh, it's fine. Everything's great. Right. You know, I know like there's probably way too many intermediaries when things when things went bad, and things get started to get worse. All of the agencies suddenly said, I need to figure out exactly which of these intermediaries are adding value and which ones aren't. So there, there's this trend called supply path optimization, another fancy ad tech acronym that will get thrown around a lot or SPO. Basically what that is, is just making sure I understand from spending a dollar to that going to the publisher, who's getting a cut of it. And so this is what's gonna cut out all of these guys who sort of wedged themselves in the middle and what it should do is kill the long tail of SSPs that frankly don't add any value. They're, they just popped up to sort of arbitrage and, you know, and none of them are public. People are always like, oh, who's public that I can short on this? They're all very tiny. Like, like I said, some guy who popped up to sell, you know, um, I don't know, some some very niche type of inventory in you know, Germany, like, like that kind of thing. So. Magnite and Pubmatic, if you look at any SPO announcement by Group M, any of the, and again, the, the programmatic pipes are, you know, they're bought by agencies on behalf of advertisers for the most part. Agencies are the ones logging into the trade desk, Google DV360, um, and they're the ones saying like, you know what, I, I trust Magnite and Pubmatic. Um, I know what I'm getting. I know the fee structure. Um, if I'm only going through them, I'm going to, you know, turn those up. And I'm going to say I'm going to spend X percent of my uh, of my budgets just through those SSPs. And I'm going to turn all the other ones off because I don't know if they're doing all these weird reseller agreements. And suddenly, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the, there's also this, um, this this may be too in the weeds. But are you familiar with the the made for advertising ecosystem? No. OK, this is a I, I'll, I'll get to it because I, I do think it's important. So. There are basically these clickbait sites that exist for no other reason than to get people to click on them. And the content is awful. I'm sure you've seen them there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It would be like, here's what Jane Brady looks like now. And it'll be like 50 slideshows and the ad density will be insane. You know, uh, you know it, I, I've, I've had sometimes on this podcast, I'll click in my computer will like somebody will be saying something and I'll be looking it up and I'll click on a site and it'll be one. I know exactly what you're saying. You know, it's at the bottom of like every Yahoo article. It's like, you won't, as you won't believe what Jan Brady looks like now or, and you do it and your computer goes slow, just advertisements everywhere. Absolutely. So yeah, th this is a big debate in the ad tech world, whether they should be turning these off because you can get, they, they, they actually love them because like if you're at group M and your goal is to get super cheap reach, you're like, Oh, you go to your boss and you say, I got a million impressions for like 25 cent CPMs. Isn't that awesome? And it was like, it showed up on one of those crappy made for advertising sites and nobody even saw it or as a video. That, that actually relates to another question I was going to ask. So you mentioned like there's a huge long tail of, you know, Dan and Andrew have 10 niche websites in Germany that, that they're uh, serving as the SSP for. How much is like when you're going through Magnite or Pomatics, how much is there a brand integrity question where like, hey, I'm a buyer, I go through them. I, I'm sure everybody's got a little bit of, but you know, it's not going to be next to, if I go through them, my stuff's not going to be next to porn or, or that type of stuff. Like it, obviously yeah. the Jan Brady, like that's not something you love your content to be, right. but it's ultimately harmless. You could imagine a much more harmful version of it. How much is working with the big guys? So, Maybe it's not quite in the number, but yeah. you're getting a little bit brand safety there. Yeah, there's two companies that are actually, this is their job, um, Double Verify, DV, and they both went public in 2021, IAS, Integral Ad Science. Um, the brand safety suitability thing is sort of their problem. <laughs> um, like that's that's their job is like when you, you know, I'm, I'm a group M, I want to make sure, you know, and, and they do they do work with the walled gardens too. So like, you know, if there's some sort of crazy video on YouTube, you would not like to show up before. 
um, their job is to sort of block that from happening. So outside of the SSPs, there is this whole ecosystem of brand safety and suitability um, that almost all large advertisers are using one of DV or, or IAS to, to make sure that that stuff, and when it goes wrong, which it, it does go wrong, they're sort of the throat that gets choked, not the DSP is necessary. So let's, let's turn a little bit more to the opportunity, right? Why this is, and, and part of the opportunity, I think, as you said, hey, all of these have been cut down 80%, right? And there's still, there's still a lot of growth to come where, as you said, We'll probably talk about the video, the video segment in a second, and that's a really interesting, potentially sexy growth story. But let's just talk on valuation because I think people look at these on a headline valuation. I'm looking at your initiation, so the numbers might be slightly stale, but you know, your initiation from I think it was April has, hey, you know, I've got a near-term price target of about fifteen dollars, you know, ten x two thousand twenty-four EBITDA. I've got about fifteen dollars, but longer term, if you look at the growth and you look at like I could do a DCF and say. $30 per share. So could you just help me frame the upside? And then I want to provide a little pushback on the valuation. Yeah, sure. So um, really, it's like I said, a lot of the long tail SSPs die. And, you know, the big ones that have the SPO agreements with the agency buyers eat up that share. Like there's so much, there's so much upside just for meeting up share. And then, you know, obviously you, you layer on a, a potential ability to take share from Google and it's like turbocharged. Right? Yep. So I think, I think that's where a lot of the growth comes from. And then second, it's like, Right now, we're in sort of a downturn. Um, and I put a note out the other day um, that was tried to frame that up because some people are like, oh, I see I see Meta at 10% growth. I see Google search at, at solid growth. What are you talking about a downturn? Um, so so there's kind of two, if you, if you think about it, there's brand advertising and then there's sort of performance marketing. And performance marketing is what's holding up really well. The brand advertising side, which is what a lot of the programmatic stuff is, it's just sort of like, it's not even really meant to be clicked on. It's just meant to like, I'm scrolling through an article. I see, oh, this show's on HBO Max. Hits me, hits me, hits me every time. Like it's, you know, the, it, it's just get the it. The performance in. is, it's the famous stuff Google got, right? You search for life insurance. The top thing is life insurance. Somebody will pay $50 if you get that click because they're likely to buy life insurance. As you're saying, the brand advertising is the traditional, if you're watching TV and you see an ad for Jeep, you're probably not going to go buy an ad. For, you're probably not going to go buy Jeep tomorrow. You can't really track that, but you're building that brand. So when you are ready to buy a, a car, like Jeep is top of mind. And it, we mentioned ESPN multiple times. Anybody who goes on ESPN, like the front page is generally brand building, not, you know, smash this monkey and go buy this thing because that doesn't really work in, unless you're actively searching for it. That's why yeah. Google's got such a good business. But yeah. 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 And, and so you mentioned TV, like you, obviously the big like brand advertising mediums, TV, you know, radio, podcast, CTV, people talk about a lot. So so programmatic is often like complementary to that. It's like, hey, you, you want two things. You want reach and you want frequency. You want to hit a lot of people and you want to hit them multiple times. So what people, what a lot of advertisers think about programmatic is like TV is pretty expensive. Let's get some really incremental, pretty cheap reach and frequency. Um, so when those TV budgets draw down, which they have, you know, and it's not just it's not just because of people are cutting cord and stuff. It's CTV is also significantly decelerated on the growth rate. Uh, I see radio and, and podcasts have, have also pretty meaningfully radio is in decline. Podcast growth is decelerated. Um, so so is programmatic. So I, I think people are. are mistaking that and it's like oh i look at the walled gardens growing again and i look at the the programmatic schmoes back in declines like what's going on there i think it's more the brand versus performance dichotomy that, that people underappreciate on that that's a question so just to lay out the question a little further it, it is a question i had like how much of the stocks going down 80 percent from 2021 to 2023 obviously there was a little bit of mania and results were probably like too turbocharged by every SPAC getting money in and growth at all costs and stuff. But how much is simply 2022 and 2023, performance marketing is held up great. If you've got something that's going to drive sales, it, there's still a budget for that. There's probably always going to be a budget for that. But companies were worried about recession. You know, A lot of things are in flux. They, pe people were over inventoried. How much of the drawdown do you think is just, hey, like we are in a, not a, a economic recession, but a programmatic recession for all of those reasons, versus, hey, the stocks were way overvalued, the competitive environment's a disaster or that type of stuff? I think it's a combination. Of, I, I don't know. I think that there's a lot of bear cases on the SSPs that feel like they're playing out right now. And and that's why you saw them uh, you saw them sell off after the last earnings call. Both Magnite and Pomatic were off like that. Let's talk about, because I do think my friends 
a lot of my friends who are long get are kind of like, hey, you need to look at this as a cyclical, right? And the time yeah. to buy a cyclical yeah. is when things are worse at their worst. And this is probably the nadir. Like nobody can call the absolute bottom, but it seems like this is the nadir. It doesn't seem like we're going into a recession. It seems like the brand building should come back. Like if you're a brand, you can cut brand building off for a little bit and not hurt yourself, but eventually you hurt your long-term results. So I think a lot of my friends who are long it kind of think, hey, this is the nadir. You want to buy the nadir versus, you know, I, I guess magnites down. 40 to 50 percent on their q2 earnings uh, on their q2 earnings results right so it, what what's going on that's driving that versus is it just cyclical i guess that's a good time to get into ctv uh, okay great great ctv is very important for magnite i mean can you describe it before we hop into it sure. so connected tv right so basically it's the same thing i explained on the open internet it's just selling for connected tv publishers and this spans from your you know fast and avod channels pluto tv and the, the random long tail ones that you'll see on like the Roku channel, uh, anything to, you know, Hulu and, and, and HBO Max, not HBO Max, um, you know, so, so they do everything. And it's, I can't emphasize enough because people kind of think of them as the same. CTV is very different than the open internet. Think about what a, com a typical commercial ad break looks like versus when you're browsing the internet, right? And an ad break on TV, Coke and Pepsi can't be in the same pod. McDonald's and Wendy's can't be in the same pod. You have to normalize the sound. Uh, uh, you know, don't you hate it when like the ad comes on and it's like 10 times louder than the show you were watching? Like this is a problem in CTV because the ad tech isn't frankly all that built out yet. Um, and then there's the problem of, I hear this all the time. You see the same ad every time and I'm watching Hulu and it's the same ad every single time. And like, it's a frequency capping problem. So a lot of these people just tried to take programmatic advertising and just poured it into CTV. And it's like, there's a, it's a very different ecosystem over here. It's a very different way you need to advertise. You need to understand that hitting people too many times with an ad is going to turn them off. And, you know, publishers need to do things with their ad server and SSPs that, that limit that if you're going to sell programmatically. Um, so Magnite, which was formerly the Rubicon project, as, as you mentioned, Magnite was formed with the merger of Rubicon Project, which was all open internet stuff, and Talaria, which was a CTV specialist. Um, they were purpose-built for CTV, uh, really, really premium video, but eventually sort of pivoted to, to connected TV. Is like this is this was 2019, the two of those got together. And I actually think so, so people will quibble on the, the it was a kind of an all-stock merger, so it wasn't really a price paid, but you can talk about the dilution. Um I think that was smart to to go after someone who designed their SSP specifically for CTV. And I think that was the right move rather than other SSPs that just said, hey, we're going to take what we do on the open internet and try to do it for CTV publishers. Um, and, and two, that there was a, there's a lot of people who know CTV ad tech well at Talaria. Um, what they then did was they bought SpotX in 2021. SpotX was similar to Talaria, uh, a CTV focused SSP. Um, it was kind of Talari and Spotix were the two that had had emerged as like the best independent SSPs for CTV. So they, they effectively cornered, you know, the independent SSP market for CTV with those two acquisitions. And now we, again, we can quibble. They, they paid too much for Spotix. They, they probably did. Everybody who did an ad tech acquisition in 2021 probably paid too much. They did do it with some of their own stock, which was over, I think, 45 bucks at the time. So that helps. Uh, their stock was is arguably overvalued, probably overvalued. Um, so, so just to, to frame it up, this is how Magnite became like, hey, forty percent plus of our revenue is CTV. Is they they merged with Talaria and then they bought Spotex. Um, so, part of my thesis again on Magnite is that in order to win as a CTV SSP, you need to have been purpose built for it, and you need to have the the ad tech talent, um, which by buying um, Talari and Spotex, they effectively have cornered. Two uh, questions on oh, CTV. Here, yeah. Go ahead. So two questions on CTV. So CTV is, you know, you're watching, you mentioned many of them, everybody knows, Hulu, Max, Netflix, Netflix ad supported. You're watching them and this is going to programmatically insert the ads, right? So I guess on Magnite, who, who are they working with right now on the CTV side? So they actually had a, so, so they effectively helped Disney build their programmatic ad tech stack. And that goes back to Hulu, right? Disney Plus only has had ads since twenty, since recently, uh, very recently. Um, so they they worked very closely with Hulu when they were at Talaria to help them build their programmatic ad tech stack. Um, 
they they pretty much work with everyone. Um, I don't know. I, I'm probably not Peacock. And the reason that they don't do Peacock is because their biggest competitor is Freewheel, who's owned by NBC. Uh, Freewheel is probably the, the biggest SSP competitor out there. And their argument against them all the time is why you should think on Osmo than them is we're, we're independent and they're not. Right. Can you say that one more time? You just so, cut out for a second. So, sorry. So, NBC, owned by Comcast, obviously, owns uh, a SSP and ad server called Freewheel. Yeah, and, and so, no, I just was making So, the the Magnet argument is why work with Freewheel when they're owned by your competitor? Work with us. Or, yeah, okay. So, yeah. I think people can see why this would be a huge business, right? Every single Netflix is rolling in the past year, Netflix roll out the ad supported. Everyone's rolling out the ad supported ad, and everyone, when they roll out the ad supported, they said, hey, we are, you know, I, I don't follow it quite as closely as you used to, but everyone who's rolled out an ad support has basically said, hey, like the results from the ad supported are great. People love it. People come in, they save money. Our rates on ad supported are better than we thought. Our engagement are better. Like everyone's focusing on the ad supported. You look at the Disney charter dispute that just ended, right? Which I know you and I have talked about offline for different reasons, but you look and one of the results is charter gets to wholesale Disney's ad supported thing, right? So obviously everyone's pushing people into the ad support bundle. So you see this huge growth. Uh, I guess the question, I, I've got a lot of questions here, but the first, they do seem to have an advantage. Like they are custom focused and everything you said with programmatic makes sense. But, you know, it's not like there are no competitors. Like Netflix, I think, is working with Microsoft on their thing. Like, Who are their other competitors who kind of actually matter on this side? Yeah, uh, there are, it's Freewheel really is, is the big one. Okay. Um, and then there are a couple of others, like Podomatic does CTV. Um, you know, all the SSPs do CTV. They're all going to say they do it. It's, it's you know, like, for example, um, and, and Podomatic's done a decent job, for example, but they don't even break out their CTV revenue. And, um, you know, it's hard to tell exactly how big it is. And it was like doubling year over year last year, but it's kind of like, oh, I'm not sure exactly what the base is on that. And now, you know, Podomatic on, on, on a piece of revenue that's not large enough to specifically break out is, is actually declining in, in CTV revenue. So um, the thought there is there, there's kind of been a first mover advantage for the guys who specifically built it for CTV. So, so Talarius Botics was one. Freewheel was another. Um, there's a smaller one called Unruly that um, was bought by a company called Tremor. Um, I've heard there. I know Tremor, it. yeah. Tremor uh, rebranding is Nexon. Um, so, so they have an SSP and they're, they're going to rebrand on Ruli. And, and I think that had a, that was actually previously owned by Fox. So I'm sure that Fox does, you know, a, a lot of, of their. Let me, uh, let me ask a bit. So it does make sense, right? Everybody's pushing to ad supported. These guys are have worked with Disney. They've worked with big guys. You can see the upside as everyone goes ad supported. And, you know, I do think cable one to unwinding, like there's just going to be a lot of growth in the sector. So I think you could frame that really easily as a bull case. Let me push it back with a bear case. Look, there's going to be six uh, online video services that matter. I mean, take YouTube out of it. That, but if you're really thinking about the programmatic, hey, we make high-end quality and then we sell it, it's going to be Netflix. It's going to be Disney. Amazon Prime, you're probably not getting. I don't know. Do you know who's doing Amazon Prime? I don't think they have full ad supported yet. I imagine they do it themselves. Yeah. I have a hard time believe they're they're using it. Well, that, that transition, there's going to be six, right? NBC, Netflix, Amazon, you name it, they'll, they'll be a few. And I, I do wonder, like, it, you mentioned in your note, Netflix will face a buy versus build decision. It doesn't seem like Netflix really likes the, the Microsoft thing that they've done. I, I don't know too much about that. But if I'm the six of them, why am I going to work with Magnite instead of just say, hey, why don't I build this myself? Like, you know, if I'm going to have 10 to 20 percent of the, mar the advertising market, no matter what, advertisers are going to work to work with me. I'm going to have a great brand product, build it myself. I don't have to give Magnite this thing. I can control it all internally. I can get I can work with the advertisers directly on maybe more bespoke things like wh why don't all of them just look at it and say, I've got the budget. This is important to me. Ad supported is the future for my thing. I can't have someone else controlling kind of my ads, just cut out the middleman and build it myself. Yeah, no, it's another, I'd, I'd say one of the more common bear cases I hear is just one that they just build it themselves. Um, it's a lot harder to build it themselves than than you'd think. And it takes a lot longer and it hasn't worked uh, for open web publishers that have kind of tried to build some of these themselves. And you kind of just, so some of them have tried to build SSPs themselves and they they end up just doing that and having their own thing with monetization from the others on the side and kind of realizing, you know, it's worth it to pay to take rate. Um, so 
it's it's been tried before uh and for a lot of these guys who have new ad supported tiers it's going to take you a while to build it you're going to have some bugs when you build it and i don't know i, I just they they're they're under pressure to see results there magnite can come in and say hey right right now today we'll start monetizing it for you uh programmatically um and they've been successful with that pitch and you know i don't i don't know maybe outside of amazon who's you know, uh, they, they, they do everything themselves, unsurprisingly. YouTube does everything themselves, unsurprisingly. Um, outside of those, everybody's working with SSPs and CTV. Um, and the, the reason for that is, and then the other piece of it, and this is the layer behind the SSP is the ad server. So the ad server is the one that says, and again, not all CTV inventory is sold programmatically. Some of it is sold direct, just like it's sold in linear TV. Actually, yep. a lot of it is still sold direct. Um, and you know, this, this shift from direct insertion orders to programmatic is, is a whole nother tailwind we can talk about. So the ad server is the one that says, okay, there's a direct ad you sold Disney, you directly negotiated this with Ford. This goes here. You know, we're not even going to throw it to programmatic, right? Uh, next ad slot, we've got another direct one. Next one, um, you know, okay, the next two are sort of open market and we'll just auction off, right? So the ad server piece of it is the infrastructure layer. Very like the ad server doesn't make much money, but it's super strategic. And and Magnite has one called SpringServe that came at a very cheap valuation when they bought Spotix. Um, so this is a, I actually think SpringServe is one of the more underappreciated assets within Magnite's portfolio. Fubo uses uh, SpringServe. There's there's a uh, no, none of the big ones use it. And and again, Freewheel is really their their big competitor. Uh, Freewheel is also an ad server and SSP. So the ad serving component of it, to me in Magnite, is not, it, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of money for them, but it is a very strategic asset that they got at a very cheap price that uh, helps lock in their SSP to a lot of these publishers. You said that none of the big ones, so Disney, who has worked with Magnite on the, Disney's not using the SpringServe ad serving product? They... Because I, I guess I'm just wondering, I hear you on, so it's a strategic they, product, but if, if nobody's using it, then it seems like everybody else already built their own or using someone else's. Uh, Yeah, it's, it's wheel is probably the one a lot of them are using. Okay. Um, and now they're kind of regretting that from, from what I hear from some of them. Just okay. because Freewheel sort of plays a lot of games, so. Yeah, because I guess I do hear you on this, just, I, I know symbols, and I think you mentioned it, like Netflix seems unhappy with the the microsoft partnership they've got netflix you know when the, the microsoft partnership ends next year or it's up for renewal next year yeah next year it may end earlier than that okay sure. but so but let's just say next year it's up and then it, netflix will have an instant decision hey if we're kicking microsoft out do we build our own ad server or do we buy and, and i know a lot of people think oh buy magnite and then you've got a functioning ad server You've got it across, like you've built out in advertising. And in the same way, Amazon kind of like, hey, when we launch a new business, you know, Amazon retail is the core business for Amazon web service. They're the core function. And then you start selling it to everyone else. Netflix can be the core demand load or the core, I guess, is supply side for the advertisements. And then they can go sell it to everyone else. Like you could see the strategic there. I guess the other pushback would be, again, Netflix history is build versus buy, right? Like I think they've done two acquisitions and they were very small IP acquisitions in their entire history. So this is a tech focused company with great tech. Why don't they just go build it themselves? You know? Yeah, they might. And I think they might build the ad server themselves. I think, I think they'll still lean on SSPs to sell, sell inventory programmatically. And like any big publisher that it, it, they'll sell a lot of it direct. And, and this is what I say to people. Direct is not the enemy of programmatic. Okay. You, you can run direct through the programmatic pipes. It's going to be a lower take rate. But the, the enemy of programmatic right now is insertion orders and CTV. Insertion orders are just the exact same way you bought linear TV. You're just buying it uh, on, on, on the connected TV streaming service. So as long as they can take some of those insertion orders and migrate them to some sort of programmatic, whether it's a programmatic guarantee, which is really just like a digitized insertion order. Uh, and then there's like private marketplaces, right? You know, I, I mentioned open is like, hey, anybody can bid. Private is like, hey, I'm Disney. I negotiated with 30, and you guys are the 30 that are going to bid in this in this private marketplace, right? So these are the kind of like lower take rate things that is mostly going to be in CTV. Um, I, I've said like the open auction programmatic that you see in the open web, the fast guys, the AVOD services, they might use those and, and lean on those heavily because they don't have the heft 
to negotiate directly with advertisers. So um, it seems to me, my concern was uh, Disney and NBC, these guys, you know, with the, especially the sports content that drives huge things as they go online. My concern was, oh, they, they take it in house. They do it. Uh, they do uh, the next thing I was going to say was why doesn't Disney, you know, the top 50 advertisers, the, the top three beer companies, seven car companies are going to do almost all the advertising. Why don't they go negotiate direct? And it sounds to me like what you're saying is that is a threat. In fact, that might be the most likely thing that ends up happening. If it doesn't, great for Magnite because they can land a big customer. But what you're saying is, hey, there is still a longer tail of companies that I maybe was discounting, but you know, Roku's big, FUBU's big. There's going to be other services. There'll be niche streaming services. There'll still be a lot of services and it, a niche streaming service is not going to go do direct deals. They're not going to be able to build this. And Magnite, you know, they can build a serious business winning the, yeah. you know, maybe not the one through 20. It'd be nice if they land the one through 20, but winning the 20 to 2000. Yeah, that's that's a good way to summarize it. I mean, they'll still win the, the one to 20. It's just going to come at a low take rate because they're doing less for them. Like that's that's the easiest way to put it is, you know, and, and again, it's so different than open web programmatic because all of these big to top eight CTV publishers, they've done ad sales forever. It's what they're good at. Like, you know, so they're, they're, a lot of them have a lot of old ways of thinking, you know, on the buy and sell side, you know, advertisers are just like, Hey, I just want to buy the bear on Hulu. And they're like, well, you can do all these cool targeting things. If you want to like pay a take rate, you can target here, you can target there. And they're like, no, I just used to buy shows on TV and that's what I want to do. Can I, you I know. I do hear that. Like, so I, I did a lot of work on Shark Ninja recently. And one thing that I heard from people uh, after I published is they were like, look, you don't understand Shark Ninja, which I, I don't know how familiar you are with them. No, they do no, the shark vacuum clean cleaners and the Ninja. Uh, if you heard of the Ninja Creamy, the ice cream maker, they do like innovative appliances, basically. Right. And I, I, my pushback is like, hey, like you can only in, vacuum cleaners have been around for 100 years. Like how much can you really innovate? You know, you know, how much can you really innovate and not get cut out by Chinese knockoffs, basically, that are going to copy them in 18 months and it's all going to go to zero. And one point somebody made was like, look, a lot of their competitors are like, the. it's run by a middle manager who's 50 years old. He's, you know, he's been there for 25 years. He's always bought advertisements on TV. He's yeah. always like done the same thing. And you've got Shark Ninjas that's like young and hungry and they're dominating TikTok advertising and everything. He's like, yeah. they're just competing with an older, slower breed. And yeah, eventually, like if you run this forward 20 years, eventually, yes, the middle manager will retire and everyone will be advertising on TikTok. But as you're saying, if you're, you know, the GM car media buyer, Yes, your your underlings are probably experimenting with people, but right now you're probably just like I've always bought I've always bought on uh, TV. Like I just go to my buddy at NBC yeah. and I say I want a hundred ads on Sunday Night Football, and here you yeah. go. And you know it, it takes time, but it, it does evolve over time. Yeah, and it's all contextual, like, right? You're just like making assumptions about the people that watch Sunday Night Football and saying like, okay, this is you know I'm a beer company and I want to do that. Whereas what programmatic is telling you is like. Hey, now that it's not, you know, over a, over a cable wire, now that it's through the internet, we can do a lot of cool things in terms of targeting demos. We can target, you know, we can frequency cap. We can say, Hey, you were hit with these ads on the open internet. Did you want to hit these people? You know, we can bring in purchasing data. We can do all sorts of cool things now that, now that TV is going from, uh, over cable to over the internet. You know, I think I'm about to, I'm about to have my first kid and like, if you were advertising to me, it, I would watch football games and you'd see, you know, Huggies diaper advertisements. Be like, guess what? Three years ago, that was the stupidest advertisement you could ever you could ever serve me. And today it makes a lot of sense. Or if you bought a car two months ago, there's no need to hit the guy with a car advertisement. Whereas yeah. if you had, hey, he bought a car four years ago, now is the time. And, and you could imagine those types of things. Like it's one of the reasons for a long time I was so bullish on podcast advertising is like getting inserted programmatically because it's coming really. off your phone. You know where the person is. You can insert it time of day. Bait. Like it, it hasn't quite played out there, but if you ran it really far forward, eventually it will get there. Yeah. Let me, I have, I want to talk ad backs and then I want to talk Google Ads trust, but sure. we, we've talked about it a lot. I just want to make sure, is there anything on the bull case or the bear case that we, aside from ad backs and Google that we haven't touched that you think people should be thinking about? I, I just think on the CTV side, the, the important point for Magnite is that, most of it, CTV today is still in search and order, right? So people talk about the growth. As long as that's all in search and order, who cares? Because the programmatic guys don't see it. Magnite put the product out called Clearline and Pubmatic had a similar one. That's basically like, listen, do that. Just digitize it and they'll make the workflow easier, make the billing easier. 
we'll take a three to five percent take rate for that. Um, but but start doing this programmatically, like, and, and you can, you know, so um, th- that point that about CTV and, and how uh, old school it's still done is important because you know you've got the growth of CTV, you know, just generally budget shifting linear to digital. Um, but then you've also got this tailwind of like the dollars now still just like aren't even uh, are just linear insertion orders that, that need to migrate over. So if I could put words in your mouth, uh, your price target, uh, you initiated with, I think, a 15 price target. I think your price target is still in the, the mid teens. If I could put words in your mouth, the way your base case kind of plays out here is, again, the stock is under eight dollars per share. So we're talking almost a double of an interest stock price. But the way this would kind of play out is over the next 12 months. You get a little bit of you get CTV. It continues to grow. People maybe digitize a little bit more, so you get the growth from CTV. And then the brand business basically stops declining. You know because the recession fears have ended. People that hey, we haven't advertised brand in eighteen months. We've got to come back. We've got to start getting people. Brand yeah. business stabilizes, grows, whatever. And as that happens, people get confident. And you know again, you've got. I'm looking. It might be slightly old numbers, but you've got about two hundred fifty million in EBITDA in 2024. 10x multiple that gets you to the 15. All probably that happens, now, but yeah. <laughs> again, that number two fifty is probably a little high now. I'm probably lower than it, that now. But, it was yeah. from April, but you know, I, yeah. I don't think I'm throwing out crazy numbers. So that would get you to the fifteen, and that's ten x multiple. Like none of that's crazy. And by the way, they've been buying back that convertible debt at eighty cents on the yeah. dollar. Which so maybe your EBITDA is lower, but the debt is lower yeah. as well because that's it's always pretty creative when you can buy back debt at eighty cents on the dollar. Okay, so that would be kind of the base case, and that frames why. I've got friends who are interested in it. Why well, you've got to buy rate and why you're in. Let me start with the last bear case I would have. And that would be the ad backs, right? We I threw out the 200 million in EBITDA number. You can look at their their reported EBITDA numbers. It, you know, it sounds great when I say 200 million in EBITDA, but if I look at their ad backs, uh, it, you know, 40 million per year in DNA. And that DNA does include they capitalize internal tech, which is always a pet peeve of mine when people capitalize their internal tech and then add it back on DNA. I, I guess that's fine, but... Then they also have 300 million plus in kind of annualized, amortized, acquirable. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and we can talk about that. <laughs> they, and I understand that, but it is just a big, big number. Yeah, $80 million is. annualized run rate of stock comp. And then they also have some merger and restructuring charges in there. So have I seen messier ad backs? Yes, absolutely. I used to work in private equity. I've seen way messier ad backs. But you know, That's this is not exactly a clean story. I yeah. think when you say $200 million in EBITDA, in adjusted EBITDA and just $80 million in stock comp, right there, people say, well... You know that stock comps a real expense, especially when the the stock's at eight. Like that's that's eating up a lot of the equity cap right there. The DNA. The, so I just want to ask about ad backs real quick. Yeah, sure. So just the way I think about stock comp is like one when I do a five year DCF, I just kind of look at the five years of stock comp, assume a price, and dilute the count by that amount. Like, I, and I get that like of course stock comp is a real expense, but it's also not a cash expense. Um, as long as you dilute the share count by an appropriate amount, like I, I think you're, you're you're capturing it. No, uh, I I hear you. It's just it's one of those things, you know. Eighty million of stock comp when you're a five billion dollar company is yeah. one thing, but eighty million dollars of stock comp when you're an eight hundred million dollar market cap company, all of a sudden the it gets a lot more dilutive. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to know how much of that stock comp is is marked at twenty twenty one prices. And if you marked it at 12 bucks, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I imagine it's inflated to an extent by options and RSUs granted when the stock was at 40, 50, 60 dollars. And, you know, the actual dilution is, is much less than that. So, I, again, I don't have the numbers right there, but just I, I think everybody has that problem right now. Right. So you look at Snap's stock based comp, it's egregious, but, you know, it's all it's all at 80 bucks a share, which is like, OK. Yeah. What is Snap now? I don't even know where they're trading now. To be I think honest, they're with at you. like ten bucks or something, probably under that. <laughs> not not yeah. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'd have to do the math. It's not. Um, it, it's certainly not the least stock based comp in my coverage, but um, again, I'd imagine that there is some impact from them granting stock at prices. And again, how the accounting works is you, you grant it, you don't change the price per share. It's all it's all from the grant date. So. Yeah. No, though, you know, the the counter that would be, hey, if you're if you're paying your people in 2021, 80 million a year and all the stock comp is at 20 and I've got friends in tech, you know, all the stock comp struck at 20 and then the stock goes to 10. Well, it, you know, investors hate stock option repricing and rightly so. Yeah. But you, you know, if it's the CEO, it's one thing. He really is responsible for the, the stock price. If it's the, you know, the lead engineers and stuff, they're not really responsible for the stock. 
And if you don't make them whole, like I, I can tell you, my friends, they look to go elsewhere real quick if you don't make them whole, right? Because you generally yeah. get bonuses when you leave and it, it's it's just tough. Yeah, okay, no, let's no. turn. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to just say it's a fair point. Yeah. let's turn so that's add backs you know i i do think it's like hey if you're going to get the growth if you're going to get the you will leverage all of this i'm fine adding back the amortized acquisition intangibles you know i'm a little funky on the uh capitalized internal tech but whatever if you get the growth i, I think that all of that's doable let's talk the big bull case right the big thing that some of my friends get so excited about and that's the google antitrust case right so for those who don't know the Google antitrust case, it's its about to go to trial. Is the trial March 2024 or is the ruling March 2024? I, I'm i not sure if it's January or March of 24. It, I, I think it's March it 2024. Like, it's, well, we don't know when the ruling will be, but people are saying it could be pretty quick, like six months is pretty quick. For yeah, so I think if I remember correctly, and stop me if I say anything wrong because I'll ramble a little bit here, but right now, I said is it right now because there's so much of the pretrial motions happening and all the discoveries coming out and everything. That's why I was a little confused. But I mean, it's March 2024. I believe it's in Virginia federal court, and this is called the rocket docket court. So people think this this ruling yeah. could come, as you said, very, very quickly. And a very quick ruling is actually interesting because there could be a change of administration in November. And I don't think a new administration, which, you know, if a new administration came in, would probably be a Republican administration. I don't think they're very friendly to tech, but it also would kind of be tough to have a administration less friendly to big tech than this one. So yeah. you, getting the ruling early could like influence there if there was a change. Uh, but anyway, big ruling could come. It's an antitrust case. Uh, government suing Google and basically saying you're an antitrust issue. And a lot of the things that Magna is competing with Google in are you know square and focus here. So we don't have to opine on the specifics of the antitrust case. But I yeah. do want to ask, you know, if Google loses this antitrust case, you know, there is a huge bull case for Magnite. So maybe you can frame that. Yeah. So again, the bull case is mostly on the open internet stuff. I think Google intentionally is like, I think we should probably stay away from CTV ad tech. We're already kind of the 800 pound gorilla everywhere. They have an ad server that a lot of people use, but, um, and, and they have an SSP too, but um, I hear mostly Magnite and Freewheel as the big ones. Um, so it would mostly be, Magnite's DV plus segment and, and Pubmatic as sort of the big like open internet resting Google's grip on their on the on the banner and, and video ads that you see when you're when you're browsing around the internet. So um I mean look, I think it's hard to ignore the fact that like right now we're in the search antitrust trial. Um next year is is the ad tech antitrust trial. If Google had to pick which one of these to win and lose, there's not even a question. They would lose the anti the, the ad tech antitrust one, and they would win the search one, because search YouTube. What do you think of anything at Google? Search YouTube, the cloud. You know, that's it. Nobody even talks about the Google's network segment. How was the last time you had a sell side analyst ask about Google's network segment on a on a on an earnings call? It's the DSP, it's the SSP, it's very esoteric. Nobody even cares. And by the way, most of their privacy problems are on the SSP and ad serving side. There's an argument that they might say, you know what, we definitely don't want to lose the search antitrust one. Maybe we should play nice and just split off the SSP and ad server and, and, and give them what they want on that one. Because when we really think about it, I don't think anybody's going to care that much if we have to spin this out to shareholders. That's, that's I think, something that can happen. I don't know, just me throwing things out there. But I, I do think that, like, if there was a spin out, which by the way, nobody's buying Google's sell side. And I'm, I'm making a lot of assumptions here. I'm making the assumption that the preferred remedy from the DOJ is to split off Google's sell side ad tech assets. So it's SSP and ad server. Um, and they would get to keep the DSP in a very, in, in a very, uh, in the worst case for them, they would try to split the DSP off. So YouTube would have to open up to other DSPs. That's that's like something I think would probably be a bridge too far and maybe something they're like, oh, man, what if they try to do that to us? Why don't we just split the sell side from the buy side? You know, um, if you read that, if you read that uh, uh, the DOJ uh, uh, filing, it's all like, oh, this is like if Goldman Sachs owned the New York Stock Exchange, which is kind of you know, not not apples to oranges to me. But, you know, it's a nice headline. Um, but anyway, that's it. Right. You split off. The buy side from the sell side. And, you know, theoretically, that removes your conflict of interest. Um, so I think it, I think there's a, a, the chance of 
this happening where the SSP and ad server gets split off from the rest of Google is higher than a lot of people think. And Pubatic and Magnite are, you know, easily the two biggest public beneficiaries of that. So um, let me just drive. Yeah. Why are they the public beneficiaries? Of, right. Is it because, hey, when you split off the if you're just splitting off the Google SSP, right? You've got another SP. Yeah, previously they were tied into Google, but it's it's not like the competitor has gone away. So is it a beneficiary of just, hey, we've, you know, there is there is something to if there's only kind of two publicly traded players in a market and they're small, not a lot of analysts, not a lot of coverage, it could be more inefficient. Is it just, hey, it's bringing more eyeballs? Or when Google splits, if if and when Google splits off the SSP, does the legacy business of Magnite have this huge beneficiary where, hey, you know, everybody had to work with Google because they wanted the DSP. Now it, it's free for all, you know, 30% of the market's up in the area and we're going to grab 10% of it and huge growth margins go up. There's less competition. Like, is, is it just a free for all? So how do you look at that? Yeah. So the, the easiest way to frame it up is if you split DV360 from the SSP and ad server and DV360 has the most market share among all the SS, all the DSPs, uh, go and, uh, go and look at Project Poirot, uh, from, from the DOJ filing. Basically what it was is Google intentionally turning on a function that forced all of that advertiser spend on DVC 360 through their own SSP and ad server. I mean, and they didn't tell them, and it was just like a harmless looking little thing that was automatically turned on for everyone. Basically that would put better bids through their own SSP and win more. Um, again, these are the kind of things where people just don't trust them anymore to act in the best interest of me as either an advertiser or as a publisher, because they play both sides and you kind of never know which side's getting screwed, but Google's always winning. Uh, so, you know, that's the easiest way to think about it is a significantly higher percentage of DV360 spend would go through non-Google SSPs. Um, so that's one. And then, you know, Two is that uh, again. It, I guess it would. I guess it would depend if you could. So th there would be a, a further. Could you split the ad server away from the SSP? And I, I doubt it. But if you could split Google's ad server from its SSP as well, then it would be huge. Because, like I mentioned, how Magnite has an ad server in CTV. Google has like ninety percent ad serving share in the open web, and you can do a lot of things with the ad server that are kind of sneaky to make sure that your SSP is winning a lot of the auctions. Um, so if we were to go further than that, which I, I think is unlikely, that would be massive because, you know, one, it would open up, you could pick who your SSP is. Uh, you know, Google's played all these games where you have to use their ad server to get access to their domain and illegal tying. And this is the whole antitrust argument. So there's a couple of ways it, it can win. Um, and again, I don't think the SSPs need this to happen, uh, but it's a huge call option in the stocks. Google, you know, let's say March comes around, Google, DOJ press release with the government. Hey, we've settled. We're splitting off our we're, we're splitting off our SSP or, you know, ruling comes in September. Google, you legally must split off your your SSP. What would you it's tough because we don't know the impact, right? It's not yeah. one of those things where you can say, oh, Magnite signed a new a new customer. I think they, they'll get 50 million. We we literally don't know the impact. But what would your gut say? the stock Magnite stock would go up if, you know, Google agreed to do that. Well, I have to imagine this, the stock would have anticipated it if the trial is going well, but let's just say it didn't. Well, uh, then, then let's go with the March 2024, you know, before the trial starts, it, you would get some some filings and stuff. But before the trial starts, there's a settlement. Google says we're we're splitting off the SSP. Stock says, all right, it's happening game time. What do you think the stock does? Yeah, I think it would be. I mean, I, I, I think the, the most likely... Uh, it would have probably already run up, but I think they Magnite could easily be where my price target's at in that scenario, at least over 10 bucks, right? I think it would re-rate considerably because, I mean, it would just be a lot of the bear argument coming out of, of the stock. What do you uh, think and, and non macro, you know, obviously there's the macro side and then there's sort of the more fundamental bear argument. Um, if the macro is turning and some of that bear argument's coming out, we've seen what happens when, when ad tech re-rates. It could be very aggressive and very, very quick. What do you think the odds are that Google uh, loses this trial and or splits out SSP? Oh, man, <laughs> I'd, I'd caveat this with um, I haven't analyzed a whole lot of DOJ cases. Um, all I would say, I don't know if I want to put a specific percentage. I think it's greater than 50 percent, which I think is a lot higher than people think. I get a lot of people who I talk to about this and are sort of generalists and they almost dismiss it. 
it's almost just like Google never loses these things. They get fined all the time. They just sort of take it from all the regulators. They're bulletproof. They're not going to actually lose any of these things. And I, I don't I don't think they're going to lose the search monopoly trial. I actually think they have a pretty bad argument on that. Um, I think they have a very good argument uh, on, on the ad tech antitrust trial because you can tie it specifically to acquisitions that they've made. Double click and ad meld and all of these different things. You can tie it specifically to illegal tying between products, the ad server to the SSP to the demand side. Um, like, you, I don't know. I think it's a very good argument that they have combined with the fact that Google's facing two big antitrust trials and there's one that they would far and away prefer to win. Um, and, I, you know, I don't know how this stuff works behind the scenes, but like I said, there's a scenario where it's like, listen, let's just come to terms on this other one. We'll give you what you want on that one. Maybe we get what we want on this one. And you got a, you got a big win here, right? Yep. You know, chalk it up. Look, I, I, I have not read... I'll admit I have not read the DOJ complaint here, so I, I'm talking a little bit out of my butt. But I, I have a friend who has a, a big position magnet, and his argument was, "Hey, you know, even if you ignore the cyclicality stuff we talked about, everything that you and I have discussed currently, I think there is a really good chance Google loses this SSP trial." And my pushback was exactly what you said. I was like, "Google's bulletproof; they don't." And he was like, "Dude, read the complaint. Like, there's a real theory of harm. It's very easy to cleave off." Uh, yeah. Like, Read the, and if you think there's any chance of that, Magnet's going to win. And his other interesting point, and I, I'm talking about him loosely, I, I, he might come on the pod and talk about it at some point. But you know, his other interesting point is if you look at the history of companies getting broken up for antitrust, like all of a sudden, you know, you've got the Google engineers who've been very protected, like they've got this the search engine gushing, people have to work with them, all this sort of stuff. All of a sudden, they're subject to the really competitive whims of the open, open market that you know Magnet has been subject to the whole time they've done, yeah. and the Google SSP, which how much market share would you say the Google SSP has? 40 to 50 percent. 40. It's got 40 to 50 percent. And all of a sudden they're subject to the whims of the market. And, you know, the things collapse because it turns out they, they've gotten fat and lazy and the people who've always been scrappy, yeah. you know, take share really rapidly. Will that happen? I don't know. What he says sounds reasonable. Also, everyone I know who works at Google is also really smart and really good. So maybe they, they haven't gotten fat and lazy and they'll subside. But as you said, it. I think the market, if I had to guess, is pricing in a sub five percent chance yeah. of it happening. And I, I think it's a lot higher. <laughs> you know, you said over fifty. I think my friend thinks over fifty. I don't know. It's something I'm going to have to work on, but I, I definitely don't think it's sub five. And there is a lot of optionality there. Cool. Yeah, I'd say it's better than I, I'd, I'd say it's better than you. And then again, I'd say that is maybe a dumb better here who's never bet on DOJ trial outcomes. So, but just you know, talking to people. Talk, talking to a lot of people about this, I, 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 I definitely think it's a much higher chance than generalist investors ascribe to it. And now, a quick word from our sponsor. Are traditional expert calls in the investment world becoming obsolete? According to Stream, they are. And you can access primary research easily and efficiently through their platform. With Stream, you'll have the right insights at your fingertips to make the best investment decisions. They offer a vast library of over 26,000 expert transcripts powered by AI search technology. Plus, they provide competitive rates on expert call services, and you can even have an experienced buy-side analyst conduct the calls for you. But that's not all. Stream also provides the ability to engage with experts one-on-one -on -one and get your calls transcribed free of charge, all for 40% less than you would pay for 20 calls in a traditional expert network model. So if you're looking to optimize your research process and increase ROI on investment research spend, Stream has the solution for you. Head over to their website at streamrg.com to learn more. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. It, it, you know, we could talk about DOJ all day. It's just, I think there is something where the DOJ, and particularly the FTC, have run up a string of antitrust losses. So I think a lot of people are dismissive a little bit of the cases. Yeah. Uh, you know, because it used to be the base rate for the DOJ bringing a case was very good. And I, I think, but this case, uh, as I understand them, and again, not having done crazy amounts of work, this case has real merits to it. And, uh, I, you know, I think I'm going to have to get smart on it. Maybe as the trial gets closer, we'll do some expert calls on it. So, all right, last question, and then I'll let you go because we've run over time. I, ignoring the Google case, right? There's the bear case on cyclicality. There's the bull case on growth. What do you think the one thing is that the overall market generalists who look at this kind of miss that you think is important to the story? It can be on the bull or bear side. Yeah. yeah, it's good. I think they think that the DSPs are just going to trample the SSPs and you're going to have a world where SSPs don't exist. 
that's right. that's like it's like they say the trade desk has kind of made all these crafty announcements like going directly to publishers undercutting ssp's take rates there is this argument that the dsps have all the power they will trample the ssps that yeah maybe pomatic and magna consolidate down but um, my, my pushback on that and, and having talked to publishers is that uh, at, at the very least for the open market internet, they very much value having someone on their side who's maximizing their yield that's yeah. separate from the trade desk, right? One thing that they would absolutely hate is if Google gets broken up and then all of a sudden the trade desk is the new Google and, you know, the trade desk can say, oh, go to direct to us. We'll give you a better rate than the SSPs will get. Well, guess what? Maybe they can now, but in five to 10 years, you just killed all the SSPs who are representing you. And now there's really nobody, you know, it's just the trade desk is kind of the new end to end. Um, I don't think any publishers want to end up in, a, in an ecosystem where that's. The Do case. you think publishers are strategic enough for that? Because this is almost the the predatory pricing thing where trade desk goes and says, hey, Dan and Andrew's SP, SSP uh, is yielding you a dollar, right? We'll yield you a dollar twenty-five, and they can t- they can eat their take rate for years and years. And then once they bankrupt dust, they say, "Hey, now you're getting seventy-five cents." And do you think you know media companies, internet companies, are they strategic enough to say, "Hey, no, we need to make sure we're funneling some business towards Dan and Andrew to make sure we've got a comp- competitor"? Or yeah. you know, managers run on a short term if they can boost their earnings. In my example, by twenty-five percent by going with uh, by going with Trade Desk and this. You know, clearly predatory pricing scenario, but yeah. go with that and you know let your let your replacement worry about the, dealing with a monopolist three years down the line, five years down the line. Yeah, so a couple of points there. One, there's like considerations beyond the like CPM you're getting. One and like for example, it's pretty crazy. We, we went over an hour without talking about third party cookies in, in an ad tech conversation. But anyway, didn't do any the, ATT <laughs> talking or anything. Look, I'm a generalist. I told you, you could tell me I was stupid at any point. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, this is it, it, it's just it's actually I think a good thing. Um, but anyway, with with third party cookies going away, everyone says like publishers have to have their own data, right? And publishers want to put that data in the SSPs. They don't want to hand it over to the DSPs. And so when you pass along that ad request, it's like, hey, you know, I'm someone who's logged into ESPN with my email. I give them the teams I like. I don't want to pass that on to the trade desk. I want to keep that close to the vest with my SSP. And I'll let them pass that on in the bid stream. And then, you know, the DSPs can bid on that information as they like. But there there are other considerations beyond just like the price you're getting that SSPs can add value. And Why like, would you well, not want to pass it on to the DSP? There's a worry that they'll use the data to to just create their own data lake and then they kind of won't need you. Um, but it, you're... I hear you on create your own data lake, but you're still the person who, you, you know, the consumer is getting served to add to, yeah. right? So even if they, they've they got all the thing, like, cool, you can build a better profile of the user. You still need to serve the user the ad through me, right? Yeah, I, I think that's fair. I think there's also like a, a, a privacy argument that you're kind of not, you're, you're kind of keeping it closer to an SSP that represents you specifically. Uh, and this came from a, a, a publisher that I talked to about open oh, ads. You know, uh, as somebody who uses the ESPN website all the time and thinks they're targeting and everything is terrible and they always forget my username, I almost wish they would be less sensitive with my privacy and <laughs> just to remember things. Let me ask one more question, then I, I actually will let you go. You mentioned a lot of time you, you talk to publishers. You talk. I'm just curious because, again, I'm a generalist in this industry. Yeah. Every time I looked at it, I started my eyes bleed. Who do you talk to for the most part? Like, obviously, you talk to Magna, you talk to Trade Desk, you cover them. But uh, who do you talk to in the industry when you're kind of getting industry scoops? Like, do, are you talking to medium-sized websites? Who are some, kind of some of your channel checks when you're developing your view of the industry? Yeah, so I go to the ad tech conferences and sort of, you know, next week I'll be at Programmatic IO, which is the big one in, in New York. So I just kind of build contacts out that way. Again, as a as someone who two, three years ago knew nothing about ad tech and had to ramp up very quickly, uh, talking to the, I use this term uh, uh, very nicely, the ad tech nerds has been um, has been very helpful. Um, and if any of those ad tech nerds uh, listen to this and feel like I misstated something, please reach out to me. So The, the, the nerds rule the world now. Yeah. So, And as a nerd, I mean, people who read the website know uh, pretty much the only thing I read are hard fantasy books. So as a nerd, I'm very happy for the nerds to rule the world. Now. No, yeah. And again, uh, I've, I've built out some context, you know, private SSPs, at uh um you know that kind of give me some and they can they can talk more candidly than oh yeah uh, you know, <laughs> when there's no reg fd and, and there's no publicly companies. traded stock price um just to just to sort of get the scoop on like you know what the dsps are doing and what their views on it are 
Um, and then, you know, just, just generally people at publishers are always helpful. And then, um, obviously the, the agency buyers, the, the group M's of the world who are the ones who are literally logging into their DSPs and, and doing these buys and just talking to them about, you know, what they're doing and, and how they're evolving the way that they spend and supply path optimization and all that. So, um, Dan, you're a little bit different than most of the people I have on the pod. Cause you know, I've had some sell side on before, but you're a sell side. So there's no Twitter account. The, the, how yeah. can people who are you know, interested here, obviously if they've got a B Riley account, they can trade through you guys and stuff. But if people who are interested in following up with you, asking questions about magnet, everything, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, sure. So email is the best way, unfortunately. Like, so we can tweet, but you know, you're, you're pretty limited. And I, I just stay away from it. I don't feel like dealing with compliance on social media. So um, I, I lurk uh, and I, I find some value out of it, but um, I, I stay away from actually tweeting anything about stocks just because I always worry compliance is going to be on me or something. Um, so you can get me in my email. It's D D A Y at B R I L E Y F I N B Riley Finn.com. Cool. D day at B Riley Finn.com. Cool. Dan, this was awesome. We might have to have you back on because there is a, there are a small cable company or two that you and I have chatted about in the yeah, past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We might need to talk about I just, it. Some point, I just, but... uh, wide open West. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> cool. We maybe after Q3 earnings, we'll follow up, but this yeah. has been really great. You can probably tell because we went at hour 15. I really enjoyed this and, uh, good. yeah. Cool. Thanks for having me. Thanks, man. Yeah. A quick disclaimer, nothing on this podcast should be considered investment advice. Guests or the hosts may have positions in any of the stocks mentioned during this podcast. Please do your own work and consult a financial advisor. Thanks.